boys, like yourself. Yeah, you just look at the look, the look and feel of it. It's very bright. Hi, visual, everyone. It's quite and I think it's like a US digital version. Hello. Um, and I think maybe if the sun had done something like that. He loves you. Uh, it could have been really taken off in the US. Hi. Um, just a quick word. Uh, there's a lot of people here without whom this doesn't happen. Um, people on the Grapevine team, Harry, uh, Phil, Hoagie, particularly Max, who's just been an absolute superstar, the Frontline Club, particularly Millie, who's just been phenomenal in organising this, um, and also Cardiff, who sponsors the event. Um, so this is what Cardiff has to say. Um, <laughs> Cardiff School of... <laughs> One moment, bear with. Um, Cardiff School of Journalism, Media and Cultural Studies is a world-leading centre for media teaching and research and is a renowned centre for the study of all aspects of journalism. The School Centre for Journalism is led by the former BBC Director of Global News, Richard uh, Sandbrook. Um, and the School Centre for Community Journalism is uh, particularly interested in launching um, a new research group uh, into digital media and society. So for anyone who's been really interested in the kind of things that are going on, please do check out Cardiff's website and the Grapevine website will have more information on this. Um, and I hope you've all had an opportunity to kind of meet each other and talk. Um, I think personally it's been uh, really fruitful for me and I met Max uh, at the last event through this and Harry and Hoagie and Phil in fact and we are off the back of the last event launching a magazine. Um, it's a platform for new young writers, it's all interviews, short form and long form interviews but we're integrating data profiling into it. So if you're interested in writing for or graphic designer or kind of any interest at all do come and speak to any of us. Um, yeah. Thanks very much. Hey, cool. So um, just about the next panel is just about to start. Um, we've got some absolutely fantastic speakers, as I'm sure you will know. Um, I mean, they need no introductions, but I think George is going to give them some Do anyways, <laughs> just in case. Definitely um, need introductions. <laughs> Don't worry, they're coming. Um, yeah, so I hope you really enjoy it. Um, thank you. Welcome back to part two, everybody. In part one, of course, you were discussing or you were hearing discussed data. I've been doing some data analysis of this panel, and I can tell you without fear of contradiction that if your surname is Lewis, your chances of getting on the panel <laughs> were a hell of a lot better. <laughs> we are supposed to be discussing uh, the death of traditional uh, media, but I'm going to introduce you to the panelists first. I'm going to start closest to me. Nearest to me is Helen Lewis. She is the deputy editor of The New Statesman. She was at the City Journalism School. She was a trainee at the Daily Mail. She started a networking scheme for young journalists called Schmooze and Booze. It sounds a bit like Grapevine, actually. <laughs> she's written for The Guardian and a very wide range of publications, and she's been deputy editor of The New Statesman since 2012. A quick skim of her writing would say that her specialist subjects were feminism, misogyny, politics, and computer games, roughly speaking, <laughs> not necessarily in that order. Next to her, is Merope Mills, who is a senior editor at The Guardian, where she does an incredibly wide range of things, which <laughs> include video and multimedia, and she, in her spare time, looks after the Saturday edition of the paper. She won a British Society Magazine Editor's Award in 2013, and at The Guardian's open weekend, she did a session called How to Spot a Psychopath with John Ronson. Not many of us can say that. Next to her is Luke Lewis, who is the UK editor of BuzzFeed. I think, I hope I'm right in saying that BuzzFeed needs no introduction, and anyway, Luke will fill you in a bit on what BuzzFeed is doing in a second. Previous to starting up the UK edition of BuzzFeed uh, last March, he was the editor of NME.com, where he won many awards, and he was at Q Magazine before that. On his left, at the end of the row, is Pete Picton, who is the deputy publisher of Mail Online and well known for his view that the success of Mail Online is down to good old-fashioned journalism. He was the managing editor of The Daily. We talk a lot about experiments in, uh, in journalism nowadays, and Rupert Murdoch lost, uh, well, I would say, about $30 million on that particular experiment. And Pete was, for a decade, online editor of The Sun, and he previously worked for Heat and Sunday People. I'm going to ask the panelists to answer very quickly by way of introduction two related questions. Is traditional media actually dying? And does it matter? <laughs> I'm going to start with Pete. 
Uh, no, absolutely not. Um, it depends how you define traditional media, but to go back to your quote you pulled up, if, if journalism is what we're talking about, then no, absolutely not. In fact, it's thriving. All right. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't worry at all. No pessimism, no gloom, no worry. No. <laughs> no I, asked, I asked you to be brief, you and you were. Seriously, um, I, I don't know, there's, there's a lot of people from City University here tonight. Or Almost students certainly. Students or whatever, or people coming into the industry as well as, as people already in the, in the industry. I think as a journalist coming into the industry, there's so much opportunity now for you in terms of how you can get published, where you can get published, what you can do, what you can publish yourself. Um, I think it's you know, great for, for people coming into the industry. There's a lot of challenges, and we'll, we'll come on to those in a minute, but now I think journalism, or good journalism, no, massive growth area. Nothing wrong with it. Luke, traditional um, journalism dis- dying? Uh, because, I mean, it's just like an amazing time for journalism, and not just for like, new outlets like, like, like BuzzFeed. Um, the, the traditional ones are thriving as well. I mean, so it was only a, a week or two ago that The Telegraph posted these figures, they made like £60 million profit last year. That's a lot of money, you know. And uh, so, I, and The Guardian had a brilliant 2013, some of the best scoops they've ever had in their history. So, yeah. So, I, online journalism platforms like BuzzFeed, they're not eating anybody's lunch in the traditional media at all? No, I always think like the media is like a really big place. And I, if we don't need anyone else to sort of fail in order for BuzzFeed to succeed. Okay. Merope. Uh, I'm going to say no as well, but um, I'm going to spice it up a little bit by saying uh, no, uh, traditional media isn't dead. If we're talking about print media, of course, of course, everyone knows that the figures have been going like that. In fact, that's not the case for every piece of print media there is. There are lots of print supplements that are actually going up. Um, The LRB, The New Yorker, I think The Economist? It's about stagnant It's about about stagnant now. Uh, I I think uh, the... (laughs) Uh, yeah. I, I could name some more, but anyway, the, I, think, I think the way people approach print media probably has to change, but it's not dead. What I would say is that the uh, traditional media money-making model is dead. There's a crisis of the business model, the if business, nothing else. The business model is, yep. you know, that there, there is still an appetite for print journalism, but not in the numbers. <laughs> the eyeballs are in so many different places that, that the business model has to change. Should we be... I would worried say about that the Guardian bus- sales have gone up for four months, the last four months. So you know, up very slightly, but up. You know. Still lo- and that's including t- in the last year, two price rises. Still losing quite a lot of money, though. Yeah, what I said. <laughs> CF business model. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But should we worry about that? Uh, Is there a risk and a danger in it? Yeah, but it's fine. We're going to solve it. <laughs> uh, it uh, yeah, there is, there is a risk. There is a risk, but it's you know, there is a way to make money from it all. I There's a new business model. The, it's the power of prayer. The business model was <laughs> <laughs> the business model was one thing, which was display advertising, and that cannot be the answer anymore. You know, simply display advertising. There are lots of different ways to make money from an audience, and it has to be not just display, but events and you know, collaborations and all sorts of things. My answer was longer than everyone else's. You can move on to Helen. <laughs> I, I will move on to Helen. Well, I'm going to disagree with everyone on the Pollyanna so far. Oh, thank goodness for that. <laughs> the happy, clappy people, because I think there is a real problem about what I would call public interest journalism. And the, the, the model always was that you bundled up everything together. You did foreign reporting, you did long investigations, you bundled that up with the crossword and the racing and some celebrity news, and you sold it as a package. And that doesn't have to be the way anymore. You have sea sites which just cream off the froth, the things that they think people will share. Who is going to be, in an, in an online-only economy, commissioning that 4,000-word report from the Syrian refugee camp? I just don't see that that's a viable business model for anybody because it won't be read by enough people. It will not be read by as many people as 10 cats that have got thoughts about Syria. No offence, BuzzFeed. <laughs> <laughs> that's not true. That's not true, right? So if you go to no, Buzzfeed, I think the offence was intended. You're creaming off the froth. <laughs> Are you creaming off the froth, well, Luke? You, you, if you go to buzzfeed.com slash hot, you'll see the most read articles... Uh, on BuzzFeed worldwide right now. And yeah, it's no secret, most of it is entertaining lists. Uh, you'll also see some other stuff in there. So the, uh, like Max Seddon, we've got on the ground in, in Kiev at the moment, and he wrote a completely, a series of like, explosive reports on what's happening in Kiev, uh, as, as good and like impactful reporting as you'll see anywhere. And that's st- one of his reports that he posts on Sunday has had hundreds of thousands of views, you know. It, it really, that stuff really does work. We're not doing it, we're not the BBC, we're not doing it for like sort of a public service, hiring these reporters around the world because we think it, it's like 
valuable in itself. We're doing it because people really want to read it. But I, I looked at one of those ones from Kiev, I don't know whether it was the one on Sunday, and it was a, effectively a very long slideshow with two to three line captions. Are you getting as much depth as people would get in print? It depends how you, how you define depth. I mean, I think the, the impact of an article like that is, it can, can be just, just as powerful. I mean, I think one of the first, thing, one of the first articles that really brought home to me the issue of, of like homophobic violence in Russia was actually a BuzzFeed article that was just like 61 photos of what is happening in Russia to gay people. And, uh, and, and it's like, you don't need the words. The photos do the job. They tell that story. They make you feel something. And that is journalism. No, I, and I, I really don't mean to cuss out BuzzFeed because I love a lot of what you do and I do read a lot of it and I share a lot of it. But I, do, I think that there's a problem with that. I think that, And I think that a lot of internet journalism, I know I'm sure we're guilty of it too, is here is a horrible thing. And actually that gets an enormous number of views. And it's tough then sometimes to go behind the here is the horrible thing to here's why it's happening and here's what the international community should do about it. And I know that I'm sure we've done very much the same things where we've shown terrible things that have happened. But it's hard without the reporting on the ground to analyse the political situation that maybe created that, to find out what exactly is driving the anti-gay laws in, in Russia, for example. And I think that's the bit that I know that I wish that I could commission more of, and I know that we don't do enough of, but it's impossible. It is economically unviable. But in the, but digital, but in the digital world, you're not going to find the explanation for everything in one place, are you? Luke, you might read Luke's, or look at Luke's slides on what's happening to gays in Russia, then you go somewhere else... Yeah, for the, no, for, for, some, for something to explain, to explain it. To, to we we do have people on the ground in Kiev. And we have someone in Syria now. We have three people in Switzerland right now reporting on Davos. Uh, and because I think we have found a model that means, because of the sponsored content, which you know drives a lot of revenue, it means you can start hiring really good reporters and send people all around the world. And we've kind of only just started doing that. We're at the kind of beginning of that curve. But hopefully we prove that it is possible to fund really serious journalism. Is it possible that you're doing it because it might be the case that in a year or two or three's time, 20 pictures of cats, we think about Syria, people will get a bit tired of. And that, you know, this is in fact your business model to be a sustainable business, to be lasting. Yeah, I mean, the, beyond the, the thing moment. is with, with, with the cats, it's like, <laughs> it doesn't actually there drive... There are a lot of cats. It doesn't you actually drive the them cats. traffic. Yeah, you go on the homepage of BuzzFeed, <laughs> there will be at least one article related to cats. <laughs> You know, they're delightful, but it's, it, it doesn't actually drive that much traffic. So it's like, in I think globally, it's like single digit percentages of all our traffic are driven by animal content. And like, it's actually more I love that popular. you know, figure for that. It's more popular in the US. Actually, uh, quite a lot of the US are, are animal related. It doesn't really work that well in the UK. So we don't do it, to be honest. People aren't that wild about animal con cute animals in the UK, funnily enough. Yeah. What a if, miserable bunch if, we are. Yeah. <laughs> if you happen to want to know more about the philosophy of cats in BuzzFeed, there's a new piece out in Wired. It's really good. We won't distract, we won't distract ourselves with it for a second. A lot of what you're talking about is sharing. And Pete, you're in the business of watching people share stuff as well. Is that going to change? Do you think in the end journalism is going to be changed by the fact that people are going to have to measure themselves in the future by how people share things rather than they publish it and find out how many people buy it? Is that a big change or, a or no change at all? Uh, yeah, I, I think it is a big change. Um, I, I think it's a good change. Um, I think one of the, the one of the biggest differences in journalism is is, is the obvious thing that, that the the previous owners or the current owners of what was called journalism are no longer in control of the readership. As in, you can only watch the news on the telly at six o'clock or ten o'clock. You could only buy your news from a news agent at seven o'clock in the morning. That's no longer the case, and we're no longer the distributors of it. We don't control when you read the news. You read the news when you want to read it, but also you share it. You share what you want to share with people. Whether, it, whether your question is about are you <coughs> judged by what you share, as in are you judged by what newspaper you read and what magazine you carry around with you and what clothes you wear, yeah, potentially, but people share what they think is, uh, is of interest. So, you know, we're all, sh probably a lot of us have shared the, the picture of the concrete being poured into... Um, Victoria Station this afternoon. We all got that sent round and, and shared all that. Um, and cats, nothing wrong with cats. Like cats, you get shared it. But then people will share things that they, they're very concerned about. Someone sent me something about Denmark <coughs> today, which is about um, killing of animals, etc., etc. So th that's a great thing. We can share all these things. But the main point is, are they interesting? 
that, that's really all that matters in, in, in what you're sharing with people. But that can be serious and it can be trivial. There's nothing wrong with either, in my view. So there's nothing wrong with cats, there's nothing wrong with, with serious journalism. But is it engaging? Is it interesting? Will people read it? Because if they don't read it, everything's wasted. Luke, do you think sharing is change, changes fundamentally how people engage with news and, news and opinion? Yeah, and I think you do have to be a little bit cautious. Uh, so we, we used to explain BuzzFeed to everyone, as, and the sort of tagline was, you know, we, we <coughs> create content people want to share with their friends. And that's, that, that is true by and large, but you do get to a point where, uh, you know, a 5,000-word article on you know the decline of Detroit, for example, or or yeah, the, something about um, what's going on in, in Kiev is, is not going to be hugely shareable. It's not going to go viral. <clears throat> Might be widely read, but it's not intrinsically. It's not the kind of thing you want to share with your friends. So I think you have to be careful not to only do journalism that will be shared on Facebook, because there's a whole new wave of of, of publishers, and that's all about who do nothing but that. You know, like sort of like Viral Nova. And it's really quite bad content, but they're just, they've kind of cracked the code of being able to get an article going viral on Facebook. So I think you have to be a bit cautious about only doing that. Mm. It's a little bit like search. You know, three, four years ago, everyone was talking about the secret of search and the secret of particularly Mail Online. Oh, it's because your search is so good. People were being trained to write headlines. To well, catch. this was the perception, and there are a lot of companies, a lot of publishers that, that worked purely on search and what was being searched and wrote stories about what was being searched. So if, I don't know, I can't think of it, if Madonna was trending, let's write 20 Madonna stories. Actually, that's not the key to search. The, key to the, the biggest driver of search and the biggest driver of sharing is something that is interesting, is good journalism. And, yeah, good old-fashioned journalism, I'm afraid. If you write something that people are interested in, it will do well on search and it will get shared. And that's Mer- the, the I think mark. people also share stuff that they think says something about them. I'm a liberal you know, I'm a, that, that's the whole basis of Upworthy. I don't know how many people know Upworthy here. I expect quite a lot of people who do pretty much, they're just a curation site of uh, liberal videos, people um, saying things that are proud to be gay, proud to be feminist or whatever. And they uh, do these infuriating clickbait headlines, you know, at 42 seconds I was crying, at 53 mm. seconds I was on the floor, you know, and, and you're like, why, why? And you click it. And, you, and, 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 you know, and the reason is that people do that and they like them, you know, they have the most astonishing growth of any media company is because it says something about them, you know, I, I'm against homophobia, I'm a feminist or whatever. And actually I think that that's where a lot of our sharing comes in. It's not from uh, silly stuff, it's from people uh, being appalled about pulled about what Ian Duncan Smith has said about Benefit Street or something like that. It's very funny when you look at our Twitter analytics, actually, the difference between things that get clicked through and things that get retweeted. So something that's sort of, you know, uh, this is a terrible t- policy that reveals everything that Ian Duncan Smith has done wrong. Frantic hit the retweet button. Anything about sex, no one retweets it, <laughs> everyone clicks it. <laughs> just be like, no, no, I'll just read this on my own and not pass it on to anyone. Um, yeah, and I think that's one of the things that's most interesting about internet journalism is that you get a really horrific insight into people's minds. <laughs> <laughs> Merpin, when, when you were instancing things that were growing, I, th- I didn't write down your list, but I think every single one of them was weekly magazines. Yeah. That tells them? us something, doesn't it? New Statesman is one of them. Yep. Small numbers, but, g- but going up. <laughs> Wait, Thank so you, Mary. Got, oh, sorry, it's 25,000, 26,000, is that right? Yeah, it's 30,000. Yeah. Figures. But, um, but uh, what I think is interesting about that is uh, that there is a sort of theme amongst the things that are growing, the, and they do tend to be those longer analytical, um, you know, the New Statesman is one. And they're more analytical. It's obviously breaking news, the... Uh, feature what you know newspapers were based on nobody wants to read breaking news anymore we all know that you know the victoria line has been flooded with cement um and and that will be old by tomorrow but there is something that there is an appetite for something and i know from the way i read um print and the web you know i do look at our own site and i go okay that's that's important that's important oh jennifer lawrence has said something cute you know and 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 i you do get sort of distracted and you and you do kind of look at the most read things but you know i know when you read print you are more likely to sit down and absorb something and uh and really take it i think there is still an appetite for that um and so yeah just less of one sorry just less well, you know, possibly more, possibly all this sort of 
peripatetic uh, you know, reading means that actually we want somewhere at the end of the week or once a week that sums it all up, that gives us something. That we, you know, we've read a lot of, lot of stuff, but actually something reflective. I think, you know, I think that there is an appetite for that, and perhaps the web means that there's an appetite for that more. Could be wrong. But following your logic, if hard news, which drove the sales of daily papers a lot, mm. isn't going to work for the reasons you've just explained, the varied package whose disappearance Helen is regretting, that's hopeless nostalgia, isn't it? The bundle's gone. Because the elements of the bundle aren't the same. The news bit of the bundle... Over. Well, yeah, they, everyone has to adapt. And, you know, all the reporters have to be reporting a more in-depth piece, the, the whys of the, the, whys of the, of the gays in Russia, rather than just, you know, gays are being beaten up in Russia. It's, it's, you know, why is that happening? And that is the piece I think you want to read at the end of a week where you've seen that and you've seen, you know, lots of people have come out against Putin. And, you know, you want to read that piece. I think that there is still an appetite <laughs> for that piece. Right. But then you've Pete. got, you talked about sharing earlier on, but there's, there's a growth now in sharing and condensing news into six or seven second videos signed by uh, your news now, this, this sort of thing, which the BBC are now looking at. So that's actually going completely the opposite way and trying to condense news right down into, into it because the perception is that we just haven't got the time to read. Which you, is, that, is that going to work, no. Pete? Is that going to work? I, You've worked at the BBC. I mean, that's, is that going to work? I don't know. I, mean, sort of, I, I, I personally, I find I, I find it really irritating. But one can complement the other. You know that you get your six seconds a week, and then at the end you get your. But essentially, we're still trying to work out the best way to tell stories because everyone would probably say they're terrifically harassed for time. But if I read a Mail Online story, I'm damn well looking at all ten photos of Jennifer Lopez <laughs> getting out of a car, and I think is she still getting out of the car? Yes, yeah, she's still getting out of the car, and you keep scrolling. And I think that's the, that's the lesson that everything that's successful, whether it's Buzzfeed or Mail Online, has has found great ways to tell stories. It's the quality of the story. I mean, so my, one of my favourite posts. Sorry to Dan, you're sitting here to make you blush. Was your piece about house prices and the graphs telling that that worked beautifully on Buzzfeed because actually that. Was the best way to tell the story about what has happened to house prices is just to physically look at the figures and that worked much better than an 800 word written written through piece would have done and what I'm hoping will happen is that we'll I think probably everyone will get a little bit buzzfeed probably that'll be the that'll be the biggest though see in five years time it, people will not think it's very odd to tell a pit to tell a story entirely through pictures for example and where it works it will be brilliant and the Guardian will be doing it just as much as any kind of new startup. Reading the, reading the slideshow from the Ukraine, it suddenly struck me that, as it were, we're all very used to reading narratives in print because once upon a time transmitting words was cheap and easy and transmitting pictures was bloody expensive. Now, of course, they cost exactly the same. It's not really surprising. You're telling stories in pictures. It's, a, it's an entirely logical development and, as Helen says, like, likely to spread. <laughs> but why pictures? Um, video. Or, or video. We're, we're, now we're seeing... It, another big change for me in journalism is now with a lot of stories. It used to be 20, 30 years ago, Journalists reported on stories after they'd happened, and you might get some reaction to camera. Now, by and large, most news stories, within 10, 15 minutes, someone will have po posted a video of what's happened. So you're now actually seeing the news actually happen in front of you very, very quickly. And for me, that's a big change, because as journalists, it brings into mind a lot of questions of what you can and can't show. So when you're reporting Syria, et cetera, et cetera, there was a question with the pictures the day before last. What do you show and what don't you show? Because you know some of those pictures will be offensive, but then they tell the story of what's really happened. But that, but that's an old dilemma, isn't it? I mean, I know it. it I know is. it's in a new but form. Now, here's the question: Now, quite often, we will get video of people dying, right? So the Spanish train crash, we had the video as a lot of people ran of that train crashing, and outlets dealt with it in different ways. So Sky didn't run it, for instance. We ran it. Telegraph ran it. I think we should have run it. But that's actually watching people die, and increasingly you get that sort of footage come through and you have to make split second judgments now on whether you will run that, that bit of footage. I think Luke, Buzz, BuzzFeed in America actually did run a, um, a video of somebody being killed after a car chase. That's why I'm getting nods. Someone who shot themselves in the shot face with a shotgun, right? And they, were the only people, and they got a lot of stick for it. Yeah, well, more recently we've got, we found a sort of technological solution for this, which certainly with photos, we have an overlay. So if, if it's um, a photo that's potentially shocking, it's blurred out, and then it's uh, if you choose to look at it, you can, you can look at it. So that's the solution we found.
I think that is I think that is a really good solution because I think there's a point in the way that TV news is always had with the watershed about what an adult audience should consume and what kind of things you would you know you want kind of left lying about on the open internet. And I find mail online's decisions about what things you will and won't put on the home page really fascinating. Because often there is a kind of I do worry sometimes though that, that warning graphic video oh, is a warning graphic video immediately <laughs> makes it the most watchable video. You know, everything that has warning graphic video you might find this offensive. Everyone's gonna watch that video. Um, you know. But, that, but um, just about the video thing, I, I um, so it's about traditional media, not just about print. I would say that I was at an event two nights ago. I was sitting where you were, and Eric Schmidt, who is the CEO of a little company called Google, was sitting here. And, um, and he said that over Christmas, he, um, his eight-year-old didn't turn on the TV at all in the whole of the Christmas holidays, just looked at his tablet. And he said, I think at that moment, I witnessed the death of TV. And, you know, that, if, I, if I was in that industry, I would be worried. But well, you're talking about largely terrestrial TV. You're not talking about the death of video. You're no, I'm talking about, yeah, I'm talking about terrestrial TV. Net being networks. Video. Yeah, networks. But that's got huge implications for journalism because you get all these think pieces written about Mad Men or girls. Well, the last series of Mad Men on AMC got 120,000 people watched it. So there's this really odd thing that you can't write about programmes in the way that they were, you know, everyone watched Only Fools and Horses. Yeah. And that's less of a problem for a smaller, kind of more niche outlet for us, but for a, for a big market paper, you know, you get one Downton Abbey now every, what, you know, couple of years. It's not the national conversation anymore. No. Breaking Bad is interesting because... We were running, like everyone, we, we were running behind a lot of people seeing it and running pieces on it, having to sub pieces, having not watched it. It suddenly got quite confusing, but you're right, yeah. Well, as I said before, people now choose what they watch when they want to watch it. Yeah. Also, those uh, things have global date, you know, increasingly we used to get these programmes way after everyone else, and because now, you know, we're like one day behind the state, so we'll all be watching the stuff at the same time, talking about it at the same time around the world. It's Yes, plaintive calls from people on Twitter, like, can no one talk about Sherlock because we don't get it until tomorrow? <laughs> think, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> right, I think we should spread this conversation around the rest of the room. I think a microphone is emerging from the side there. Please ask a question. Would you just tell us who you are? Um, my name is Rebecca, and I'm part of the Grapevine team. Um, I'm just thinking about... Um, BuzzFeed and sort of a big component of its success is its ability to do things like A-B testing and analytics and there's a kind of really strong emphasis on on um, very strict kind of analysis and the type of thing between comparing retweets to shares and all that kind of stuff so you can curate your content based on really measurable um, uh, statistics. Now do you think that is or can be applied to print journalism and to more traditional forms of journalism? Um, and are models like that being transferred and being transposed to try and rejuvenate print journalism? Yeah, I don't know that it can really. And I always just, it, it's baffling to me uh, trying to imagine myself as a print journalist and how do you even know whether your, your article has been a success? If I, I met someone from the Daily Mail newspaper and I was like, well, how do you measure success? And he just said, well, if the editor likes it, that's his <laughs> only measure, which is crazy. Uh, it seems crazy to me because we have so many different ways to measure it. But I think BuzzFeed is very like data-driven, you're definitely encouraged to look at stuff that you've done in the past that has shared well, and maybe do something a bit like that again. But only to a certain point. We're, def we're not Upworthy, right? So Upworthy, every writer, Upworthy, they have to write like 30 headlines for every article. And then they use technology to choose the most shareable one, which I kind of think is... You have is, to write 30 headlines? Yeah, yeah. which yeah. I actually think is sort of genius. Uh, <laughs> but um, we don't do that. If we, we have technology to choose two or three headlines, but not many people do it, to be honest. It's more like a culture of choose a headline you want. If it doesn't do that well, maybe, maybe learn from it in the future. But we don't, we're not like slaves to, to um, optimization in the same way that Upworthy are. I'm really pleased to hear you say that because I think that one of the things that I most dread about the increasing spread of analytics is analytics can only tell you what people know that they want and what worked well in the past. And I do worry that if, if they become too well used that people will just want dollops of essentially what will happen to the film industry where people just want sequels or they want existing IP and that's why you end up with Battleship the movie and then everyone goes oh why did we think this was a good idea this <laughs> turns out to have been a bad idea and I, I think nothing can you know going back to print media you always had to do a thing which was a group of people who were really interested in the world and really curious who went actually that's re I'm really interested in that I wonder if anyone I wonder if and I think Martin Clark says this about you know this kind of hey Doris 
his idea of what he thinks is good journalism is something that someone would shout over the fence to someone else. Like they would want to tell someone about it. And that's something not directly nineteen fifties about that. Image, I know, isn't which it? is yeah, which is you know, very Daily Mail. But it's it, it's the same point is that technology can only really tell you so much, and I don't think we'll ever be luckily a substitute for a human. Hello, it's me again. Uh, it's Oli Awaka GQ. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a question exactly on that subject, actually. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, I'm very interested about how this, you know, not about analytics, but about the day-to-day -day act of journalism uh, working on the internet and how it affects people. And now people have things like traffic targets and, you know, you have to hit as many readers and stuff and how that actually affects the, your output. Like, I'm interested, as the New Statesman and BuzzFeed, how many stories a day, and be honest, do you do <laughs> to, to hit targets, and how many do you do because it's a great piece of journalism, and how many times do you ring someone up or go somewhere and ask them about things, and how many times do you actually just reposting? you curating. I love that Upworthy doesn't have journalists. It has curators, uh, and I'm interested in that kind of area. You have a post quota? The statesman? No, we don't have a, a post quota. So we have 20 bloggers who contribute. And basically, you know, I, that's a mixture of we commission them on subjects that we want or they send in ideas that we want. We've got a regular science blogger, a politics blogger, who are essentially licensed to do the things that interest them. I'm in an incredibly luxurious position, probably more so than anybody else, because we don't have... You know, we don't have those kind of rigidly analytical traffic types. We're a really small team. Our volumes are only ever going to be very small, but then our overheads are also very small. So I spend a bit of my time not doing stuff, which is, an, which is a quite a luxurious position to be in because actually, you know, the, the, the whole point of why people want to read The New Statesman is that it's not just churning through vast quantities and posting every video that it finds and harvesting everything it can. So it would be actively damaging for us to do that, I think. Luke? Yeah, we don't have post targets. I, I met someone the other day from a digital spy, and, and he was a freelancer, and he said he had to do three stories an hour. That sounded absolutely oh hellish, God. like sweatshop-style conditions. And we definitely don't have that, because it wouldn't make any sense, because some people, if you're concentrating on like short posts, just here's a funny video, you could do ten of those in a day. But then other people, they're working on list posts that take forever. So like we, our senior writer, Tom Phillips, he did a, a great... Thing on how the media would report the apocalypse. It took him five weeks. You know, there was no one standing over him saying, "You haven't written anything for five weeks." Uh, so uh, it wouldn't make any sense to have to have quotas like that. So there's some people, yeah, on a day-to-day -day basis, they're not making, they're not out making calls, they're writing posts. But then there's other people in the in in the office. You know, we uh, broke a story the other day on the editor of the Telegraph, like uh, being sacked, and that was just completely old-school reporting. That someone had a tip off and then someone else made a call and stood it up. So that's, that sort of thing goes on as well. How was the hit rate for the story about the apocalypse you'd spent five weeks on? It was, yeah, it was pretty good. It didn't do millions, but it did a couple of hundred thousand. It was amazing. We definitely didn't think it was, we definitely thought it was worth that five weeks. Down yeah. here, halfway Just through. Yes, sure, we'll take, with so many hands up, we'll take two, two, two questions and we go, first one there. Next one over here. Richard Johnson, I'm a reporter from Public Finance magazine. I'm just wondering about the distinction between print editions and online content, as long as uh, those remain two different things. I mean, The Guardian and New Statesman, probably there isn't much of a distinction there. You could argue there's perhaps more of a distinction at the Daily Mail between those two things. Uh, and certainly what happened at The Telegraph the other day, you can see that there's still um, kind of ramifications in newsrooms. The, is the distinction such as exists between print and online going to continue or is it going to narrow further and what are the sort of implications from that? Park that for a second. Another one coming up. Thank you. Um, my name is Michael. I work for a San Francisco startup. I'm actually a technologist uh, with an interest in media. Um, my question is um, uh, uh, to respond to your point about if uh, an article is interesting, people will read it. Um, given the way online advertising works, and therefore if more people read it, the more money you get for it, how do you deal with reporting something very boring but very essential, like an important, an important change to tax legislation or something like that? Everybody needs to know, but kind of dull. Could you pass the mic for Left and forward, left and forward to this lady over here. But, uh, okay, um, print and online editions, first of all. Pete. Um, 
But it, 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 it sort of comes back, I think for me, it comes back to what I said to you before. When you work in print, you have to aim for a 10 o'clock off stone time, as they call it. You have a limited pagination, so you're only doing a certain amount of stories. And that's, that's how a paper works. Online, you don't have any of those restrictions. So, um, in, my, in, my, in my view, you take the best of both. So, uh, I worked at the Sun uh, prior to uh, Mail Online, and the Sun had some great paper content which we used on the, on the site. But once we got into work, we could do our own stories, new stories, breaking stories, our own stuff. So just built. So I'm, I don't. I don't. I personally, I don't see a, a distinction really. It's all just a great source of content. Perhaps it, the the distinction is convenience. Maybe that readers will take that content in a different way, or it's delivered in a different way. But for me, I, I don't see a, a distinction. If it's good content, then great. Why not? The the great thing for me is now I can get it out to more people wherever they are in, in, in much easier than I could before. Merope. How do you uh, do boring but essential without losing shed loads of money? Well, if, I may, just, if I may translate that question. Uh, you just do it, and it's, uh, you have to do it. If we didn't do it, then we wouldn't be the Guardian. I mean, it's just fundamental to who we are, and uh, we don't see it as boring either. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, you know, it's, it's, essential, it's an essential part of our brand, and if we weren't doing that, people wouldn't come to us time and time again. But you haven't made it work financially in the digital era yet. No, not yet. <laughs> but it's, okay. a, it's, a, it's, a complicated, it's a complicated place, The Guardian, uh, with a no compulsory redundancy um, clause in, in a strong union. So, you know, there's a large staff there from a print product. And, you know, it's a... Are you hinting that's a problem? No, I'm, I'm just saying... <laughs> just saying that there are a lot of people still work there who are there to produce a paper as well. You know, other people have been more uh, aggressive... In their in staffing. Yep. We're we're much uh, we're much kinder in that respect. Right. That's a good thing. Okay. Again, a couple of questions, starting over here. Um, I guess relating to the previous question, um, even if you have the serious content that doesn't get clicks, your advertising relies on clicks, and it relies on viral, and it relies on things like that. And for that, you're guided by what people will click on. What if it turns out that what people want to read and will click on is like a bit misogynist or a bit kind of offensive or do, are you guided by what people want because you're a journalist and you're there to give people what they want to read or do you have like a moral kind of job as well to guide people away from things that are a bit misogynist even if they think they want to read them okay park that one wow let's go right over the other side there oh. okay it doesn't matter keep going wherever you were going Hi. Um, given who are you, uh, Rishi? Um, given that there are uncertain revenue uh, models across the industry, does the kind of commercial viability of native advertising and sponsored content um, possibly threaten the integrity of online publications? Thank you, uh, Helen. Ads, offensiveness. <laughs> yes, um, I think. Actually, what we've seen is that there's, there's, there's a move away from gross high volume using agencies to sell display ads and just racking up, you know, you have your overhead slot, you have your MPU and stuff like that. Those make very little money, per, you get very little money per page impression. And actually, I think probably more where it's going for someone like us is more about, for example, sponsored posts. Um, the New Republic, who we should have a content sharing deal with, have a, have a great way of integrating that into their homepage, but making it very clear that it is sponsored content, but still it's not in a traditional ad slot. Um, the same way about sponsored sections. We have a sponsored energy section. The Guardian's uh, like development bit is sponsored by the Gates Foundation. You know, that, that kind of thing, which relies on a brand wanting to associate itself with you as a, as a brand that is, that is valued and trusted, so you, you would ruin it if you then plastered it with tits. Essentially, it's not what someone. No, well, anyway, no one's going to advertise the New Statesman because they love tits. <laughs> not a sentence I should have started, but there we go. <laughs> um, I think it is a really big problem because I think that the problem about internet advertising is, yeah, is, is it is purely eyeball based. But I'm sure that the, I'm sure you would say this that you probably get more money out of your readers, like because you're bringing people readers, and that's why the FT, for example, are very keen for you to register for their site 
because they find out that everybody's a company director, and that makes them much more, vi you know, much more valuable to advertisers. And that's probably very much the same for our readers too. And I think that's probably where we'll go away from kind of gross volumes of advertising into more specialist ways. We are, we are already moving away from eyeballs to engagement. So, you know, just people coming in from Google, seeing one article, bouncing straight out again, it's, it, there's, there's, no, there's, there's no future in that. People see straight through that. Luke, I, I, Luke. No, go on, Maripi. No, go I was on. just going to say uh, one other thing, because you keep asking me about the money of The Guardian. Something I should say and would like to say <laughs> is, um, is that The Guardian doesn't have to make whatever The Telegraph made, 70 million. It is, it is a, it's a not-for-profit company. It is owned by a trust. It doesn't need to make a profit. All the money that it makes goes back into making Guardian and good journalism. So uh, it's, it doesn't have a Rupert Murdoch type figure going, make money from my pocket. You know, it's, it's, it's for the good of journalism. I was merely assuming you wanted to avoid losing money. Um, <laughs> the, uh, Luke, you, you need to answer the question about native ads. Are they a risk? Hmm. No, I mean, you know, ask the New York Times, you've completely em embraced it as, a, as, as of this, this month. And... Um, uh, but it's really nothing new. Though. People people often talk about like sponsored posts and native advertising and BuzzFeed like it's this new thing. But you know, I'm from a magazine background, and advertorials have been around for decades. And uh, I think the only thing you have to worry about is that the, you need to make sure that there is a clear dividing line between what is editorial and what is commercial. And you know, at BuzzFeed, I mean, it couldn't be more obvious. So the look and feel, the general structure of a sponsored post on BuzzFeed is the same as an editorial one. It tends to be a list, tends to be like led by images, but it has the brand name right at the very top. It has, it's in a different color. So it's similar to like a sponsored result, search results. It's in a different, you know, the sponsored ones are in a different color. It's the same thing on Buzzfeed. So there shouldn't be any ambiguity whatsoever. As a matter of interest, in terms of clicks and engagement, how do they perform against the straight editorial? Slightly lower. and you slightly lower but if you compare like a, a, a sponsored post on BuzzFeed to a, a, a regular display ad online it's much higher engagement right. but not quite as high as you would get with an editorial post okay fine okay I've lost track of where the microphone is this is down here at, towards the front thank you thank you just to make a really quick point about Google and um, if you look at Google five years five years ago the ads uh, that come up on top, they were a little bit more yellow than they are now. So that's sort of oh, right. blurring away. And my name is Rosa. I study magazine publishing. And no matter who I tell that I study magazine publishing, I usually get this very, this look that sort of goes, oh, I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the point that I want to make about BuzzFeed that coming back to the story about Russia, I think <coughs> that the first thing we did about Russia was the weird stuff that Russians eat that got oh, yeah. people really engaged. And then that's how the conversation rolled. And then also, for example, publishing things about cats. There's a lot of sites that, publishing thing, that publish things about cats, cat shaming and so on. But then... <laughs> cat shaming? <laughs> wow. That's cat wonderful. Shaming. I must look, admit that's a new shaming. one on me. Fat shaming, but with cats. But the thing, when I read BuzzFeed, I feel that I belong to BuzzFeed community. I feel engaged, and what BuzzFeed does, it just not raise awareness, it raise engagement with the stories that we read and we share. So I think that comes back to a point when I'm a reader. Um, can I question the quality of content? Because everything that happens to the print, it, be it becomes a coffee table magazine, uh, people want quality, people want to keep the magazines. But in print, if I don't pay for it, can I ask for the quality? Okay. I think that's a good question to ask. Park that one. Thank you for cat shaming. Uh, right over in the back corner there. Hi, Craig, assistant editor at The Gateway. Um, I'm not sure how many people in the room saw the, uh, I think it was CNN today posted, or maybe not today, posted a thing about a woman who was, or girl who was stabbed 40 times um, by her sister. And they used a very clickbaity sort of Twitter handle talking about, I think it was actually on BuzzFeed, so Luke's not. Mm -hmm. Uh, about how uh, it was sort of, she was stabbed 40 times, you won't believe the reasons why, and then the link. How do you maintain journalistic integrity in the battle for getting as many clicks as possible? Right. Uh, Pete, can you value something you don't pay for? You don't charge at the mail? Yes, I think, yeah, I think Sorry, you Sorry, you don't charge online, I mean. You value it in time. So if you... Time spent with it. Time... We mentioned engagement, engagement here, and, yep. and, and it's true. Engagement is becoming more and more of a metric for use online. So people have 
our read it's far more competitive to get our readers to read us now than it was you know than it has been in media historically so time is a big currency now so that's yes you can value people if they spend time with we measure how many stories they read how long they stay on the site etc etc and that's one of the key metrics for us now to keep them on the site right <laughs> integrity versus clicks anybody got anything to say so well, far they haven't already said luke uh, yeah, but it's a really hot issue at the moment, headlines and how far you should kind of optimise headlines to make sure people click on them and read them. And uh, people keep using this word clickbait and it kind of really annoys me because it suggests that there is another kind of headline that you don't want people to click on. And I don't know who these journalists are who, who are writing articles that they don't want people to read. It's like, <laughs> you've written something, you want as many people to read it as possible. And I've, I've employed a number of people like that. But that example of CNN, obviously they got it completely wrong because that was a very sensitive story, involved lots of people dying. You can't really turn it into a game, can you? You know, it just feels wrong. But basically, if you've written an article that you want people to enjoy and, and share with their friends and stuff, I mean, just make the headline as, as clickable as possible, and why not? Could you believe the reasons why, by the way? Um, yeah, well, that's a good point. What were the reasons why? Did anyone actually find I, out? There might be a time when we all have had so much of this that we actually see a thing and we think, actually, I can believe the reasons why. And hmm, I think it's a trend. It's a, at the moment, those and, things you know, tend to at be the very moment, Exactly. It's, a very, it's it. a very of the moment thing, those hmm. kind of headlines. And there can be a point where you start thinking, I, you know, last time you let me down with that one. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like a film reviewer who recommends a dud film and you think, I'm never going to listen to you again. You know, that, that, that could happen with this trend. But doesn't it make you sad? I'm sorry, I'm going to sound like old Grandma Lewis here, but doesn't it make you sad that the art of the pun is now dead? <laughs> I loved a good slash bad pun. I think puns had a good, like, 200 years. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we can move on now. I think they'll come back. I think Helen is right. I think, I think they'll come back, actually. Down. They'll just take a holiday, <coughs> then they'll come back. Right, up there. That's it. Yep. Um, I think the... Things Against the Cats is very unfair. I think BuzzFeed has a very good idea with where it's going with its news, but can BuzzFeed ever really compete against traditional media, which has that kind of trust, which perhaps BuzzFeed hasn't earned yet? Thank you very much. Yes, there's a um, lady in white blouse down here who's been, had her hand up for a long time. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm, it's interesting that none of you have websites that are behind paywalls, and no one's mentioned paywalls, and I'm obsessed with paywalls <laughs> for some reason. Um, do you not think it's slightly irresponsible to make people think that they can expect free quality news when actually, you know, that's just not going to happen anymore in 20 years' time? Five years' time. Thank you. Luke, I think you get to start because the first question was about trust. Hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we're like the, the world's most trusted news brand right, right now. We're not there with the BBC or The Guardian or The New York Times. But it, like, these things take time. So we, we, we but you are just, aiming to get there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so I'd advise anyone, to, if they're interested, to take a look at like buzzfeed.com slash world or slash long form. You know, there's some, some really interesting stuff. You know, like I was saying to Helen, we have reporters all around the world now. And um, so we, we want to get to that point where we are one of the world's most trusted news brands, but these things take time. Right, everybody's going to get a go at this question, which was certainly worth waiting for. Is it wrong to be encouraging people, Pete, to assume that quality news can be free? Pay for it's nine. And it is the newspaper on, on, an iP on a tablet form. Uh, and that is a very different business model from the Mail Online. The Mail Online is about free to access, it's about creating scale, it's about then monetizing that scale. Um, and the, the app is obviously a, a very, very different model. I think either of those models have to make money. It, so whatever we do, none of us are charities. So unless we continue to make money to come back to the core point of the whole discussion unless we have a viable business model none of us are going to have any journalism uh, unless it's blogs etc etc which you know is up to the individual so I, I don't think you know quality journalism hopefully will drive that business model it depends how you define quality journalism and how you consider quality journalism um, I consider quality journalism to be it's right across the scale it doesn't necessarily have to be 
Um, people enjoy the journalism in different ways, from, from cats to Syria, from showbiz to sport. It's all, it's all viable if it is interesting and well done and put together. If it's well done and put together, I hope we all feel the same way. It will have a business model, therefore it will not suffer. Is my view. Luke, are you planning a paywall at any time? No. No, BuzzFeed is just is purely funded by ads, and by ads it's, it's, it's mostly sponsored posts. And it's not going to stop you developing more and more quality journalism and chasing the reputation of the New York Times or anything else? No, might because you have we, to we've... Might well, you have to charge in that progress? Well, so far we've found that, that the ad model is, does drive a lot of revenue, enough revenue to you know, hire reporters all around the yep. world. Yep. Merope. Um, why do you think that there will be no paywalls, in, that everything will be behind a paywall in 20 years' time? You said that as if that was just a fact. Um, well, I've been working in the FT, and they're like, convinced that everything's going to go, the weekend's going to go behind a paywall, everything's going to go behind a paywall. I, I, I don't agree with that. I don't think it will. Um, uh, we currently have no plans to, it doesn't mean we never will, um, but uh, I think I've gone from working at The Guardian when I called up people in America, I said, hi, I'm from The Guardian, The Guardian, I've never heard of The Guardian, heard of The Times of London, so now I can call anyone in America, and they're like, oh, wow, that's The Guardian, and because we are open, and we are open in America, and we have an American branch, and we set up a, 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 an office in America, and because anyone could access that site in America where Glenn Greenwald worked, a person called Edward Snowden read that blog, got in contact with us, gave us the biggest story of the world last year. That wouldn't have happened if we were behind a paywall. So I just, I just don't agree with that. Helen, do you have any material behind paywall? No, we don't. What we do with um, magazine content is that the majority of that, we wait a week before we publish it on the web which is for us the, the right balance between obviously the writers really like their content to be online we like to publish stuff um, going back to that idea about the division between print and online actually there's lots of stuff that works brilliantly in the magazine people adore in the magazine doesn't get any hits online um, and, that and vice versa what, online content that wouldn't work in the, yep. in the well no there's definitely loads of stuff that we do that taps into particular communities that the average new statesman reader would be going who are all these people <laughs> um, yeah it's just it, it's just impossible but um I, yeah, I, my resistance to paywalls is, is dropping, I think, now that I've seen things like the leaky paywall. Because I think what you can do, and what the Telegraph does, I think, is very clever. So all the Telegraph blogs, should you want to read some madmen shouting about <laughs> the issues of the day, you can do that all for free, and that doesn't affect... Those are the kind of things that people would share on a day-to-day -day basis. But your regular readers who come back there every day and want their news every day, they're going to hit that, and they might very well be tempted to drop two quid in the pot. And I think that's not, I think that's not a bad model for other small publishers like us actually because you know you want to be able to have things so Russell Brand's incredibly long essay for us last year did well over half a million hits you know absolutely astonishing success that was down to that being very shareable and we wouldn't have got that if, it's, if it was behind the paywall but equally well you want to be able to protect some of your magazine content and you want to give people a reason the other weird thing is the fact that we've seen that our, as our website traffic has grown, so have our magazine subscriptions. There was always this idea that one was cannibalising no, off, off, yeah. off the other. But actually it provides a very good shop window for the magazine. And the kind of things that do incredibly well on online are the things that are written for online. I mean, that, that brand piece is, a, is an exception because that was a kind of a big media event. But generally, if I looked at our top ten things from last year, they were, I would say eight out of ten of them were written for the web and they were things that would only work online. Right, I'm ma we're massively over time, so I'm just going to take uh, two questions, starting with the person who's managed to seize the microphone right there. Um, hello. Um, Who are I, you? Sorry, I'm Jessica Lambert. Uh, I'm uh, the deputy editor at Londoner's Diary. Um, there's a lot of aspiring journalists uh, here, and, um, and, and I was one of them when I was here last year. And um, I want to ask, um, you're all obviously wonderful successes now, um, but was there ever a moment that springs to mind in your career where you made a mistake and in that moment you thought, oh God, that's it, this is over, I'm never going to work in journalism again. <laughs> And would you like to tell it to a room of 100 people? Yeah. <laughs> we got some great answers from people like Ian Katz last year. So, um, okay, inclu including The Guardian trying to blow up the sun. 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 They got a few, right, right in the back corner <laughs> there again. They got a few moments to think up a plausible answer to that question. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, I'm Catherine. I work at Nesta, which is the UK's innovation charity. And I manage a program in hyperlocal media. And you would maybe remember that Theresa May said of the BBC in November last year that um, BBC sort of alternative models was undermining local press. So I just wanted to get your opinions on um, bigger news organisations and looking at alternative models, say hyperlocal media, and if you think that is going to undermine traditional press and print. Okay, let me let me. I'll, I'll reverse the order for those those two. Let's let's do the hyperlocal question we've had just now, Pete. Um, new models, new ways of doing well, it. Well, we, we just read a lot about patch in the states, which didn't really work for various reasons, and I, I can't claim to know the ins and outs of it. But that was a massive uh, attempt by AOL to do hyperlocal, and it didn't work. Having said that, the thing I always find curious with we talk about classified and the death of classifieds, except if you try and find local services through Google. Um, you can't really do it anymore because if you try and find a plumber or whatever, because the big firms are so well optimised, actually you don't get anyone local anymore. So actually what you get for is a call centre and stuff like this. So I'm still quite surprised that there isn't a model for bespoke classified uh, advertising in your area. Um, and there was, I'm sorry I can't remember the gent's name, he was a journalist, he was a sub-editor in Blackpool on a local paper. And he left and he launched his own site which is purely on recommendations but genuine recommendations of local tradesmen. And he was having some success on it. In fact, The Guardian did, did a small media story on him. Uh, I think Roy Greenstone did a piece on him. And I'm quite interested in, in that element of, of, of hyperlocal because it has to provide a service to people who are hyperlocal. And we talked about advertising earlier on, but one of the problems with advertising is it's not really served people's needs for a long time. It's been... People want advertising, they want to know about products, they want to know about what the products provide and stuff like that. And I think we've learned lessons as journalists about how you provide content for people. I think advertisers have to look at that in the same way. So native advertising is a step in that direction, but really I think advertising and local advertising have to look at what they're providing to readers as a service <coughs> as opposed to trying to force a message at people. If they can resolve that, they'll find a value in what they do and that might help us as journalists and publishers because don't forget... When you're publishing something, it's about journalism and the commercial side that goes behind it, because you haven't got that, you haven't got any journalism. So that might go some way towards addressing the balance. Maripi, you're looking sceptical, are you? No, no, I was still thinking about what I was going to say. Well, I've been <laughs> sitting here for five right. minutes. Right. Well, well, I actually have a good one. I was just trying to disguise the facts. Of, you're, a, of you're, only, you're only a few seconds away from being able to give it to us. We're going to go right through the panel on this, the moment that you thought it was all terminal, starting with Helen. I, I, not that I can tell you without getting people in, or me, more. No, no, I'm going to disguise names. Because it's worth it for a laugh. Unless I go like, <laughs> there was a magazine called The Blue Blitzman. And, no, <laughs> <laughs> not really okay, okay, I'll, I'll do mine, I'll do mine. I hope, yeah. Okay. <laughs> So I, I'm going to disguise names of this because I, I do tell this story quite a lot against myself. It's one of my favourite stories. Um, I am going to disguise the names of Nick's. Not fair on the people. Too many people in this room. So it's not when I actually thought my career was going to be over, but I did want to die. And that was when I was editing the magazine and I was relaunching it and I wanted to get Bono to do this particular thing. Uh, and it was in the middle of a red campaign. And I called up uh, Freud's and this person, I knew very well at Freud's, and I said, can I get Bono to do uh, this thing? And he said, no, he replied immediately, no chance with Bono. How about, and we'll call her Sarah Smith. How about Sarah Smith? And I looked up from uh, my computer and I said, who the fuck is Sarah Smith? And, and, and my dear colleague said, oh, she's that awful leathery woman. You know, she's terrible. She's an awful leathery woman who presents, what are we going to say here? Whatever. Um, spring watch. It wasn't spring watch. And uh, <laughs> uh, she's that awful leathery woman who presents spring watch. Uh, uh, and I, so I, being the person I am, I just sort of tend to just verbal diary. I just replied to this person who I knew quite well, not well enough, it turns out. Who the fuck is that woman? <laughs> who the fuck is Sarah Smith? Is she that awful leathery woman who presents Spring, spring Watch? <laughs> if so, no thanks. And he replied, Nice reply, that's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you all. It's so worth it just to look at that. I'm so over this now. Very good. I've been telling this story for years. And, uh, 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 and I, I thought I was going to be sick. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, and uh, I, I, so I just said to him, I think I'm going to die now. And, uh, and he was very kind about it and said, you're going to have to do better than that. And I was like, I'm really sorry, I'm so sorry. Uh, and he said, I think you're going to put her in your magazine now, aren't you? Because she wasn't very famous then, she is quite now. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I said, yes, I think you're right, I am. And I did. I think that was the right, I think that was the right thing to do. Great story. Luke. So I used to be a music journalist and I uh, was editor of NME.com and I, I really can't remember why but one Saturday morning I woke up and I decided I really didn't like Ed Sheeran. Right? <laughs> and um, so I just started writing about how rubbish he was and I thought, hang on, I get all my Twitter followers, we're going up on Ed Sheeran, let's all just talk about how rubbish Ed Sheeran is. Uh, and then I realised he has like millions of followers and they're all, they all really love him and they did not take kindly to this at all and so these millions of Twitter followers they all gang up on me and, and, and suddenly I saw it from a different perspective and they were calling it like cyberbullying you're being horrible to this young man it's cyberbullying and so people like really complained and people complained to like the, the uh, chief executive of IPC which is the company that owned NME so it went all the way to the top and, it was, and uh, I was accused of, yeah, of being a bully and, um, and I did for a little while, I thought I might actually get sacked. But I learned a valuable lesson, which is just never be horrible on Twitter. Nothing mm. good ever comes from it. So from then so on, true. I've just been perfectly nice at all times on Twitter. <laughs> so I think it was good. It was, I, I learned a valuable lesson from it. Never Pete. upset Ed Sheeran fans. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, was there a moment when the floor opened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How long have you got? Yeah. Um, I was a music journalist. Um, I once interviewed a really big band, and after two hours, realised I hadn't turned the tape recorder on. <laughs> <laughs> the, other, the, other, the other big tip I've got, if you're ever interviewing someone who's got a pen in your hand, never go like this. Because I did that, it got stuck in my hair. <laughs> and for five minutes, I didn't acknowledge it, and they didn't acknowledge it. <laughs> but the biggest lesson I ever got was never be honest with your editor, right? Never tell them the truth. Because I was, as a young mu music journalist, and you're only paid if you got published, and I was quite frankly, on the dole at, the moment, at that time. So I was sent to review a new girl who'd come to London, and she was doing a small PA in a, in a room smaller than this, and we got there, and we waited four hours for it to come on, and she came on with three dancers, and the curtains went up, and the mic fell over. She did three songs, uh, and I wrote it up, and I went home. And I wrote up the review, spent all night writing it. I went into the office the next day to give it to the editor. Bear in mind, I'm not going to get paid unless this gets published. And he said, what was she like? And I made the mistake of saying, she only did three songs. And he said, well, we're not publishing that. This Madonna's never going to get anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, don't forget if you've had a question and you haven't been able to ask Helen, it. Helen, you... Helen's had time. She's had time. Come on, Helen. The baying mob demands blood. Um, the only one I can think oh, of is that sorry. I once went, I was doing an afternoon shift at a paper that cannot be named, and I went to interview someone in the theatre, and they were a very larger than life personality. It was 11 a.m., and they brought a bottle of champagne, which we drank together. I then stumbled through Soho to work, um, desperately eating sushi on my way home in sort of like vague carb Godzilla. And um, arrived at work, realised I was still hopelessly drunk, and went, said I had hay fever and went to the nurse and got whatever antihistamines are, basically amphetamines. <laughs> <laughs> and that was fine, I was fine after that, so it was a happy ending. But yeah, that could have, that could have gone very wrong. Indeed. I suppose it could. Thank you very much indeed for reminding me that I'd tried to let Helen off but didn't, su but didn't succeed. Um, don't forget that if you haven't been able to ask a question... Uh, you can ambush the panellists later, but for now, would you please thank them for a splendid performance.